my heart said 96 beats per minute, feels like I'm playing PUBG, about to get a chicken dinner. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to Dominic and Monty for their glowing introduction to Oracle. <laughs> the best part about working for a giant evil corporation is the large database of stock images I have available <laughs> for my slides. I'd also like to thank Kent um, for inspiring me to go to my wardrobe this morning and decide who I'm going to be today. <laughs> Maybe Monty should be where. <laughs> so, who am I? Um, my name is Anton. Uh, I work as a consulting member of technical staff at Oracle, which is a fancy term for a project lead or principal engineer. Um, since 2006, on and off, I've been working for Amazon EC2, which was a very rewarding career. Um, I decided to change last year and join Oracle. Uh, and since then, I've formed a team to investigate monitoring of our giant fleet of cloud servers. Um, what I found was uh, we were lacking in certain monitoring departments. Uh, to, we didn't know exactly what was going on in terms of bugs and hardware breakages and so on in the fleet. So uh, we're busy building this fleet diagnostic system. Uh, which has been pretty cool and challenging, and I'd like to share some of my learnings with you. So to start, um, I'd just like to give you some context about the environment within which we work. Uh, so as an infrastructure, as a service cloud provider, we run customer VMs uh, using Xen on a Linux box. To do that, you need an operating system, and you need some data plane software, and you need some control plane software which is in charge of launching instances, attaching network attached storage, et cetera. I should probably stop moving around. So our very basic unit is a single node. And then uh, the Numbula hierarchy, which is uh, the product that this came from, uh, forms these nodes into a cluster. Uh, and each cluster has a certain number of nodes in it. Uh, they can vary from tens to hundreds. And then each site has a bunch of clusters in it. Um, all the clusters in the site are similar, except for one, which is called the admin cluster. And the admin cluster has uh, more orchestration logic and software on it. Say, for example, to connect to databases and so on and so forth. Site level things rather than the things that are responsible for launching instances and attaching storage, et cetera. Then we move on up to regions, which are a bunch of sites, and then the world. So the thing I'd like to convey from this is, firstly, there are a hell of a lot of servers in there. Um, and we also have these random little interspaced ones, which are our clouded customer uh, service. So Oracle will go and set up an, an own, their, your own little micro cloud at your business for you, too, if you like. And we control those from a central location as well. So not only do we have normal, what you would expect, data centers, we have these random ones interspersed in various locations connected to us through VPNs. Of course, that's not what the real world looks like. The real world looks more like that. And. Up until now, the real world that we've been seeing it was more like that, maybe somewhere half between that and what it really is. So you get network outages, as you can see at the end there. You get power outages, which can take down whole data centers. Uh, you get broken hardware very often, mostly disks. Um, and the most prevalent thing are software bugs. We release a lot of software very often, and each time we release, there's a 100% chance that some bug is going to find its way in there. Uh, and then we have to detect that as soon as possible, preferably before it affects a customer, and fix it. 
Uh, we haven't had to do with aliens yet, uh, and the Tyrannosaurus uh, hasn't happened. But we have had a data center that pretty much burnt down uh, due to heat. <laughs> So how do you typically deal with these things? Um, one way to deal with them is metrics, and metrics are a really good thing to have. Um, having a culture, of a culture of metrics within an organization is something everyone should do. You should have your weekly metrics meeting where each team goes through their metrics and tries to explain what those bikes were. Um, sometimes you have no clue, like Carl in this picture. And then you have to dig down into logs and see what's happening there. The, the bad thing about logs is they can get really, really noisy. And I'm sure many of you have spent days of your lives, if not more, trawling through logs and logs and logs and logs, trying to find that damn thing that broke, which is not being logged at the error level for some stupid reason. Um, so up until now, customers have been our canaries in a lot of situations, which is bad. Obviously, you don't want to first hear about a huge outage from your customers. Um, I think AWS's Twitter feed can uh, attest to that as well. Um, and the other thing with uh, metrics and logs is that they can't uh, represent complex conditions. So a metric can represent a number at a point in time, and a log can represent some text that you have to go and look for. But it would be nice to combine those, those two in a way that's easy to find without having to find the one and then go look for the other one. Um, also, the other thing about metrics and logs is usually they're built into the product itself. And unless you're really, really good at continuous integration and you roll out all the time, it's quite difficult to get new metrics into your code deployed onto the sites to to detect emergent conditions that you just find out about. So in order to address these problems and some others, we decided to make a fleet diagnostic system. OK, so what is fleet diagnostics? Fleet diagnostics is very simple. It's a bunch of Python scripts written by product experts. So for example, the networking guys would write some networking diagnostic scripts. The uh, control plane guys would write scripts to detect whether the control plane is working well, like whether instances are stuck in launching, and so on and so forth. Um, and they're written to detect known issues. And unlike metrics and logs, they return three things. One is a health determination. So the script has the intelligence built into it to determine whether it thinks the thing is healthy or not, and perhaps how badly screwed it is. Um, the other thing is a scalar, which is optional. If you want to return a number value, you can. And then you can graph that later if you like. And the other thing, especially in cases where you're failing uh, the health check, you can add reasons in there, which will give people's clues about why this thing failed and what to do about it later. Um, these scripts run periodically, either five minutely, hourly, or daily. We try and reserve the five minutely ones for things that are very light and quick to execute. Uh, because there are a limited number of five-minute slots in a day that you can use. Uh, most of them fall into hourly, and then the very heavyweight kind of investigations uh, we run only once per day. Uh, in our model, these can run either on each node, each cluster, so in other words, one script per cluster, or on a site level. So for example, there's some things that you would only want to run on the clusters. So to determine, for example, the network latency between two clusters. It doesn't make sense to do that on each and every node, so you would write that, re restrict that to run once per cluster. And very importantly, they, these scripts run within a sandboxed container. I'll go into that a bit more later. Um, we sandbox with C groups uh, just to make sure that the script that is being run doesn't interfere with the thing it's trying to measure. Um, the other thing is this is completely decoupled from the rest of our control plane. It's got its own repo. It's got its own Jenkins deployment platform. We can rap rat rapidly develop it and integrate it with sites um, as we detect new failure cases that we want to measure. Um, so I'll just step through how to make one of these things quickly. So 
if you look at the diagnostic to the right, it's very simple for our users to make a new diagnostic. All they do is write a Python class, which inherits from diagnostic, type in a little blurb there about what it does. So this simple one here just checks how much free memory is left on the node. Um, then it has a variety of configuration options. Uh, one is the period. Is it hourly, five minutely, or daily? One is the level. So should it run on every node, site, or cluster? And then you can restrict it to certain types of nodes. So if you remember from the previous slides, we had guest clusters, which are the normal ones with VMs, and admin clusters, which runs <laughs> services. <laughs> now that you're awake. Um, and then the other thing you have to provide is a timeout. The default is one second. Uh, if it runs any longer than that, it will be preempted so that we don't use up time that the other scripts are supposed to be using. Um, then the other thing that a, a diagnostic script needs is just a diagnose method, which returns a diagnostic result. Uh, this particular one has a fancy little method in the middle to map memory percentage to what it thinks is healthy or not. So in this case, if you're using 99 or more than 99% of your memory, your node is unserviceable. Uh, if you're using 75 or greater than 75, it's poor. Anything below 75% and we think it's healthy. Um, we've provided a, a variety of libraries for people to use to make this easier. Uh, in the worst case, you can shell out to bash to get the values for you in our container. Um, and then, as you can see at the bottom of the script, it's returning a diagnostic result. In the first parameter is the health value, either health good, bad, whatever. Uh, the second is the scalar value, so it's returning the memory, the actual memory percentage that it measured. And the final parameter is a text string that you can, you can send back for the details. Um, in this case, we only send that back if it's not good. So if it failed, we say why. And this particular one just says, I measured this many bytes, this many bytes were used, and that works out to blah, blah, blah percent. So that's what they look like. These are a sample of the ones we've implemented so far. Um, I know this is quite a lot to concentrate on, but I'm just going to highlight a few of them that I think are good examples. So the first one at the top, instance.system.cpu. So that is measuring the CPU load of instances running on the DOM0. And why that's interesting is because of crypto mining. So what happens is people steal people's credit cards, and then they launch a bunch of instances, and then they pin the CPU trying to mine Monero. And obviously, we don't want that to happen um, unless they're a legitimate use case. And this is one step towards preventing that. It helps our fraud team uh, determine whether there are bad people on our hosts. Um, that one is running every five minutely on each node, and it has a timeout of five seconds. Uh, it's also restricted to guest nodes because they're the ones that run the instances, not the admin nodes. Um, then there's some inventory kind of things, like what is the version of the RPM of the diagnostic script themselves that are installed. It's useful to know, see how up to date your sites are. Then there are the network checks. So uh, the first one check the network connectivity between clusters. Um, how many hops did it take to get from one cluster to the other? We've had, well, I'm sure everyone's had bad network configurations where your packets just get lost or take forever to get there, and this will be able to tell you it's happening and how many hops there are. Um, it's latency, and then PMTU is the, the size of the TCP packets. Uh, if that's misconfigured, we're supposed to be using jumbo frames. If we aren't, then it goes slowly, and things don't work properly, etc. Uh, there's another set of them to check the same kind of metrics between our nodes and our network attached storage devices to make sure that uh, customer storage is working properly. Um, another interesting one is the number of incoming connections to our database layer. So we had a bug recently where every time you call a certain API, it creates a new transport to connect to the database. And over time, the number of connections to the database was just increasing and increasing and increasing until they started ooming. And then we had to figure out what the hell was going on. Um, so this will tell us that's going on before it happens next time. Uh, similarly, we measure the number of outgoing connections from our control plane uh, servers, services. Uh, which is the other, the flip side of that coin. 
Um, number of stuck instances, that's instances stuck in launching, terminating. If, they, if that grows, then we know something's stuck on the node and the, uh, the orchestrations are not progressing to take customers' instances from preparing to actually launch that they can use them. And there are a bunch of others. Uh, NTP sync, I'm sure you've all had NTP drift issues in the past. Um, uh, the bottom one's quite interesting. Uh, Zen mitigation, so recently we had uh, Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities. Uh, this measures whether the node has had the patches installed and we are no longer vulnerable to that. That's very important uh, in terms of compliance, et cetera, to get that out on the fleets and make sure. Um, and then there are a bunch of the usual candidates, what you would expect, like CPU load, disk full, have we run out of inodes, how much free memory do you have? So those are the kinds of things you can measure with this, which are perhaps a little bit more difficult to measure with metrics and logs. Um, so now I'm going to talk about our architecture, and I'm going to try and use this microphone so I can walk around. Hello. Okay, so on this side, we have our node. And just to be clear, it was very difficult to represent that these two things were exactly the same kind of thing, but on the all nodes, we have this software plus all the other software, and on admin nodes only, we have this software plus the extra diagnostic service. So I just thought I'd explain that. Um, so what we do is on every single node, we install our diagnostic scripts, and they run in within the C group sandbox, uh, which enables us to be able to rapidly deploy them without having to worry about them going rogue and taking down uh, resources that are meant for our customers. Um, the C group sandbox, in combination with Python multiprocessing library, ensures that they only use one single thread of, well, okay, so first of all, only one diagnostic executes at a time. Um, they use a single thread of CPU. They're limited to 200 megabytes of memory consumption and 30 disk writes per second. So far, that has helped us. Um, if we come across anything else that we need to ch change, we can. Uh, we also nice them down to 19. Um, the other thing they have here is a kill switch. So we have an external config server. Uh, if we find things are going awry, maybe these things are dosing the diagnostic service, we can change the kill switch and switch them off. Um, at the top there, you'll see GitLab and Jenkins. So this is all in GitLab, and we have a Jenkins pipeline to deploy them rapidly once they've passed code review and our integration testing. Um, so the diagnostic scripts run there. Uh, the collector is a Python uh, script, which wakes up every five minutes, and it works out a schedule uh, along which to execute the scripts uh, every day. So. You have some scripts at five minutes, some at one hour, some daily. So you've got to work out a schedule uh, within which to um, execute them. You also don't want to execute the exact same script at the exact same time all the time, especially not on all the nodes at the same time, because it might call out to something and then inadvertently DOS your service. So we use a hash of the host name of the node to randomize the order in which they are executed per node. So each node will execute them the same way but each different node will execute theirs a different way to the previous node, if that makes sense. Uh, so the collector executes them and stores the results in a RAM disk. The reason we chose a RAM disk is because A, the results are small and it's fast, but most importantly, um, these scripts are here to detect problems. And one of the main problems we've had is either full disks or read-only file systems. And if our collector could not write in those cases, then it can't detect those cases. So we have to kind of try and build it to be as resilient as possible to the failures that it's actually trying to detect. Um, then we have a publisher. So the publisher reads these results and pushes them up both to our diagnostic service, which I'll get into now, and also to RSS log, log stash Kibana, uh, and graphite to Grafana. Um, the other thing is we only store the latest results in the RAM disk, so it will never use up more memory than we expect. Uh, the new results just get overwritten. And then we've also built in a little CLI here so that if everything else fails, our data database dies, that API Grafana is down, blah, 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 whatever, you can still SSH into the node and find out what the results are. 
Um, so moving along, uh, the diagnostic service is written in Java. So this is, this is all Python. Uh, this is, and Python makes sense here because uh, all of our users are Pythonistas. Everyone likes and uses Python a lot in our organization. And to write your diagnostic framework in something that people don't usually use is a big mistake. So Python here, Java here. We like Java servers. They tend to be quite resilient and fast and well understood. Um, OK, you get the occasional GC pause. But if you have enough of them, then you round robin around that, and there's no problem. Um, in terms of scaling, of course, we have a bunch of these, and we have a bunch of these, and we try to make it so that there are not too many more of these to these, so then that uh, helps with scaling there. Uh, we also have two thread pools here. Um, the one thread pool services the incoming connections to store diagnostic results. And the other thread pool services the outgoing connections to a REST API, which we serve from here as well. So if for some reason our nodes go nuts and DOS this thing, it A, won't take out our control plane database, and B, won't mess with our REST API. You'll still be able to query the, the previous results that had come in. Um, so I guess to the REST API then, uh, Carl here, our Tyrannosaurus Rex developer, has uh, been using his laptop to uh, communicate with the diagnostic service using our REST API. We have a little Python client. I'll show you an example of the CLI that you can use to look up the latest results uh, of the diagnostics, which we store in the database. Then if you want historical data, so for example, what failed last week, uh, you can look at Grafana or Kibana. Uh, not just last week, it's up to date as well. Um, and you can get nice pretty graphs of diagnostic health over time, how they failed, how, they, um, how we fixed them and they went back to normal. And Kibana, as you'll use, um, will give you the actual uh, reason, text fields, and, and things to line up with the failures that you see in Grafana. Um, the other thing we've been working on, which is still in beta, is a cross-site diagnostics dashboard. Uh, which you can see at the top there. We've been writing that one in Python with Flask, uh, with Redis and Celery workers. That's been a lot of fun. Um, and basically what that does is it will periodically query for the diagnostic results from the diagnostic service across all sites and make them available to you in one place. So you can uh, investigate them there, go and link to their Kibana and Grafana graphs, and ultimately, do deployments of new diagnostics and set up alarms and so on and so forth. So that's future work, but uh, we've, I started on that a few weeks ago. Uh, OK. So that's enough of this microphone. Hello, hello. So what do our user interfaces look like? I'm, all, I'm sure you're all familiar with that picture or anyone that does DevOps is. Um, and we'd like to make that experience as nice as possible for you. Uh, so here are some examples of our user interfaces that we have made thus far. Up in the top left is the dashboard web app that I referred to. Uh, it basically lists all the sites that we have deployed to, uh, what their status is, whether things are running properly and a link to the diagnostic results for the site, uh, as well as the Kibana and Grafana links. In the top right is our Python CLI calling against the REST API. I don't know if you can make it out from there, but uh, basically what it's listing is the system.disk full metric, uh, and it shows which nodes are failing that. And the reason field is populated with the file systems that are filling up. So we have mount storage data usage there at 82.2%. Uh, bottom left is Kibana. So you can search for you know, a particular failing diagnostic over time, a certain node, uh, whatever you want. And it'll draw a nice pretty graph for you at the top. And you can set up alarms on that as well. Uh, Grafana, similar. We usually use Grafana as the first entry point because uh, you can hover over a certain graph and you can see which diagnostics are failing on the site. 
And then if you scroll down, uh, we have an individual graph per diagnostic which shows which nodes are failing. So you can hover over that to see the nodes that are failing. Then once you've got the nodes that are failing, you can go and find them either in your CLI or in Kibana and see why they're failing. Um, again, we're still in early days and we plan to add a lot more to these. So future work. Um, firstly, what we'd like to do is integrate alarms into PagerDuty. Um, so set up alarms on Kibana or Grafana dashboards and have them automatically page people when they're on call to go and find out what's going on. And then mainly uh, automated remediation. So that's where this really becomes powerful, when you can kick off automated workflows based on conditions that you see that have arisen on your site. For example, you have a lot of instances stuck in launching, uh, and you're about to get a whole bunch of tickets from customers, and your automation kicks in, goes in, finds out why they're stuck, and perhaps restarts your node control plane software, uh, which then starts reprocessing the instance because it was broken, um, thereby preventing customer escalation. Um, Another one, maybe you get full disks. Uh, maybe something's wrong with log rotate. You have to go kick it, make it start rotating the logs again, or just clearing out the temp folder. Somebody's gone and written something which filled up the temp folder. You can go and automatically do that. Obviously, with great power comes great responsibility, and you have to integrate a lot of throttling and things to make sure you don't take down your fleet. Um, and then I thought I'd just mention similar tech that you can try uh, at your own companies if you don't want to write something like this from scratch. We had a few reasons to write ours from scratch. Uh, firstly, the, the nodes software with, which runs our customer VMs is quite a like, hallowed ground, and it's difficult to change things in there because things are running, and they're running well. So it's hard to motivate to just, yay, install this latest open source project right there on the DOM0 with the customer's VMs. So we decided to take a more careful approach and write something very specific and very controlled like the C groups, um, and then play more with the technologies on the reporting side and upstream. Um, but if you don't have a similar problem, you can try uh, diamond collectors from Graphite. Uh, they run periodically and measure things like uh, CPU usage, memory usage, etc., cetera, um, and will report them up to Graphite as a scalar value. Or you can try the new fancy Elasticsearch Beats, which looks really cool. Uh, you can have a log beat, which does log scanning for you and tells you the number of uh, error messages. You can have metric beats, which emits metrics, and there's like a file... I'll beat. I know, it's a bunch of agents that can do similar things, so they'll measure CPU in that as well. Uh, there was a network beat, which can do pings to certain servers for you, etc. And it all goes up into Elasticsearch, so you can look at it in uh, Kibana and whatever you want. So those are cool things that you can just try out today. That's pretty much what I have to say about that. Uh, then I'd just like to talk about our team. Uh, yay, team building. Um, so we have a team run by Bryn Divi, Divi, who's hiding here in the front. Uh, and we're located at Black River Park in Observatory. It's a really cool, well, so I left Amazon and I came here and I didn't know what to expect, like working for, you know, the big bad Oracle that everyone seems to hate. Um, what was it going to be like? Oh, my God. I was... Uh, I had a bit of trepidation, but I, what I found when I got there is a little bubble within the Oracle universe of a startup that had been acquired and was thriving. And the people I work with there are really, really smart, fun, and the, the working environment is very like, quiet and respectful and relaxed. Uh, we have catered lunches. Uh, we have very flexible hours. A lot of people just work from home. Um, it's kind of all that you would expect from a, like a high-end startup, uh, but you're kind of encased in this corporate bubble, which gives you like fully comprehensive medical aid and good salaries and stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> and um, huge databases of stock images to play around with. 
So I'm very happy there, um, and I'm glad I made the move when I did. Uh, and if anyone would like to speak to me about it afterwards, I'll put my email address on the end of the slides. Uh, and then the final slide I'd like to leave you with is something I think about every day. I've actually got it pinned to my cubicle. Um, <laughs> it's the two states of every programmer. So some days I feel like a god, and I know tomorrow I'm going to have no idea what I'm doing. And today I might feel like I have no idea what I'm doing, but tomorrow I know that I'm going to feel like a god again. So there's something to look forward to. So Dominic, from your talk earlier, it sounded like you were on the right side for a while. But the more time you spend there, the more you'll be on the left side. But the right side's always coming again, so keep that in mind. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's me. Thank you. Just go back to that Python slide. Hi. The Python log uh, checking slide, please. Is there a bug? Uh, no, no. It's <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so basically, after 75%, you save memory, you, you label it as poor. And Oracle does like JVM. So isn't it poor the whole time? <laughs> very good, very good. Well spotted. OK, so the actual question is, have you looked at Prometheus and investigated yes. it? Because it seems to be the love child of the internet at the moment. Yes, we do like Prometheus. Um, in fact, one of our sister teams is using Prometheus exclusively. It's a bit of a different model, because it's like a pull model instead of a push model. So you actually have to ha have an API on each of your services, uh, which exposes a health uh, check. And then Prometheus will go and periodically ping all of your API endpoints to find out if they think they're healthy, uh, which is cool for scaling. Um, it's maybe a bit heavyweight if you want to run an on-demand thing like this on an entire fleet of uh, basically dumb VM containers. But it's definitely very useful for the micro-container, I mean, microservice side of things. We have large services and health reports. Um, we have looked at it, and we definitely do want to try and integrate it with our fleet. Thanks. Uh, it's mostly because you had suggestions around open source packages for monitoring. I was wondering if you've investigated stuff on the auto remediation side that you have packages you could re recommend there. So that's for like next quarter. <laughs> um, I know when I was with Amazon, there was significant uh, investigation or what's the word? We spent a lot of time writing an in-house one. Perhaps that could have been better by using an open source one. I know at the time there wasn't much available. I haven't looked recently. If you know of one that you can recommend to me, that would be cool. Uh, maybe we can talk afterwards about it. Otherwise, we were just going to default to using Flask uh, periodic beats tasks. Uh, sorry, celery, celery beats to kick off automated tasks. But I think then I guess you still need the whole framework with packages on how to SSH into a host, you know, kick a process, da 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 da. So if stuff like that is available, that would be cool. Don't forget there's Vida points for the best question. Hi, Anton. Um, just a question on the database. You kind of glossed over it. Is it using yep. MariaDB? What's the question? Is, is it using MariaDB? Yes, yes. I'm glad you asked. It's definitely using MariaDB. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, glad you touched on the Zen mitigations. I'd, I'd like to know what the sort of 
performance regressions you've seen across your global fleet as a result of the Intel vulnerabilities. Yeah. And then secondly, what were the challenges in rolling this out across a global fleet? And uh, whether you, do you have unfettered access to the, to the sort of Oracle global fleet? Thanks. Sure. So I'll answer your second question first. Um, if you're referring to uh, rolling out the diagnostics themselves, or our normal software. Uh, the normal software is on a, quite a long release cycle, and it's slowly piecemeal being broken down into parts that can be continually deployed. Uh, but for the diagnostics, we started off with CI first. Like, it's going to be a dead end if we don't have that. Um, we need to be able to detect something, uh, roll out a diagnostic to show how widespread it is within a day. So that's what we're aiming for. Uh, we use the Jenkins pipeline and GitLab um, to run it out. And it's just built as an RPM and just do an RPM upgrade. Um, and then to the Zen mitigations thing, um, we were worried a lot about control plane, specifically performance, um, with patching the spectrum and vulnerability patches because it prevents branch prediction and things like that. And it's kind of hard to tell because, like, on the whole, you won't see much of a difference. But then you could see a problem with a very specific kind of thing that might have been using branch prediction to its advantage. And now that doesn't work. Um, we haven't, I don't think the performance team has measured any change. We were very worried about it. And then it seemed to be like, meh, install the patches, and it was OK. So maybe it's because we're running Python and slow anyway. <laughs> Hi, um, will you ever open source this so I can deploy it in a MariaDB cluster? Would we ever open source what? Um, your monitoring tool. Uh, the fleet diagnostics? Yeah. I was thinking about it, and I'd like to. A lot of things do actually surprisingly get open sourced at Oracle more than Amazon. Um, <laughs> um, currently, it's quite specific to our domain. But I think with a little bit of work, we could make it uh, available in the same way that Elasticsearch Beats is, uh, whereby it's a little agent that you can install and separately install the scripts that you want. and. Uh, we'd probably have to provide some sort of uh, pluggable backend to store the results. But yeah, I'd, I'd like to look at that in the future once it's more mature and we've rolled it out everywhere and ironed out all the kinks. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering how long does it take to figure out a node is down for the dynamic timing of the nodes and the five minute push model? It seems like there may be a bit of a lag. Yeah. Node is down. Now, that's a difficult issue. If you're detecting that the node is down from a different node, which is trying to ping it, then it should work pretty quickly with, within five minutes. If you're trying to get the node itself to report that it's down, in other words, you would detect that by not seeing a timestamp from that node for a long time then that would probably be five minutes plus five minutes, and you'd have to have something watching that particular node's timestamp. So I don't think we're doing very well at that specific use case right now with a diagnostics report. Um, I think we'd have to, so there, there's a different system that another team's working on which will constantly ping the kernel of each uh, DOM0 as well as uh, look for open ports on instances and try and make sure they're up as well. And that's more equivalent to what you would get from the uh, EC2 offering, where they give you liveness uh, of your instances. Uh, we don't have something like that built into the fleet diagnostics. That's actually spot on time. So uh, thanks very much, Anton. Thank you.